because what if these existing courts have also been hijacked? However, there is nothing in the law that says that the government or the law societies have a monopoly on generating a court. We can convene our own courts, and using these proper true courts, we can bring criminal charges to bear against even the existing courts, the existing officers, and uh, even the people in the government, but it gets even better. We don't have to actually bring charges to bear against them. The Supreme Court recently ruled that property can be seized if it is argued, based on a balance of probabilities only, that it is the proceeds of crime. Gross negligence is a crime. Failure to distinguish between statute and law is a crime. Committing extortion, committing mischief, any of these things that the cops do repeatedly, all of this is a crime. And if they've been doing it their entire career, if they've been ignorant their entire career, guess what? You've been grossly negligent. Every penny you've ever been paid is proceeds of crime. We get to take it from you without you even going to court. You won't even know about it. You just come home one day and everything's gone and we say, sorry, everything's been seized because it was proceeds of crime. I don't think we have to do it a lot. We only have to do it to one cop on the day he <laughs> retires. Holy shit, you watch that tell the line. That poor cop, I feel sorry for them, but if the, no one stopped them from looking into these words, no one ever stopped them from doing their own due diligence, they've been invited to do it, and for the most part, I think the vast majority of them are actually the best people out there. These are the people, I think, who are motivated by their heart to stand for others. There might be some bad apples who are bullies, but I think for the most part, they get called, they're, they're answering a call to be a maker of the peace and to be a peacemaker. And then I think what happens is the law societies, they start generating words and telling them this is the law when it is not the law. I can show you a quote online from a tax lawyer, David E. Sherman, who essentially states that detaxers are crazy because they read the law and they think they know what they're reading, but they can't understand it because they've never been trained as a lawyer. It looks like English, but it's not. So here are these people saying flat out, this is neither French, it is neither English, it looks like English, but it's actually law, and it is the most deceptive language I've ever looked at. I started doing what I do, I broke down this, this statute, the uh, Children and Family Service Act. No idea what had happened, so I break it down, look up every single word. The deception in there is unbelievable. It is an extraordinarily precise language, and it is used to generate ambiguity and deception. But when you know how to read it, it's extraordinarily precise. So I started looking into the acts, looking into the statutes, and found out that they are not law, that they are bound by the law, and they all need your consent. Every one of them. You are a human being. The rule of law says that uh, equality is paramount. In Canada, since we're all equal, nobody has the right to govern someone else without their consent. And they need evidence of that consent before they try governing you or imposing these statutes and orders and rules on you. They have that evidence when you show them your government-issued ID because you had to submit application for it. And that is what they're doing. They're coming after your person. Now, I've heard some people talk about the person being a separate entity. The courts recently ruled about this. A guy went in and he tried saying, I'm acting for my person. And he tried distinguishing between who he is and who his legal entity, his person is, his corporate entity. It doesn't work like that. You can't do that. It's like, imagine a husband and a wife who are married. Now, you've got a man, you've got a woman. They now get married. Now you've got a man who is a husband and a woman who is a wife. Now, let's suppose the man goes and cheats on his wife. And he says, well, it wasn't your husband cheating. It was the man you married that's associated with the husband. Would that work? <laughs> no. That wouldn't fly at all, would it? That person is, your, is their evidence that you are their child, that you have, have been acting in, I hate to say it, folks, but you've been acting in a grossly negligent manner by abandoning your rights and begging them for remedy because it's easier to do than to look into the words and say, where does it say I have to do it? The fact is, it doesn't say you have to do it anywhere. Now, there are actually three stages of freedom. The first one is dependency. Dependency on the government. Most people think, 
That's where most people are. They're completely dependent on the government. Then they say, I want to become free of this. I want to become free. And the next step is independent of the government. But that is not the final stage of freedom at all. Try getting there and you are going to live a very lonely, very sheltered, very sad life. You're not going to be growing your own wheat and everything. The third and final stage of freedom, I believe, is an interdependency where as free human beings, we agree to be dependent upon each other and we share an interdependency. Not so that our immaturity is a threat to them or causes them fear, but where we accept our responsibilities, we accept our duties. We have a charter of rights and freedoms, correct? Where's our charter of duties and responsibilities? Children, infants, have rights. Take a tin away from a, a feeding child, he will cry because he knows his rights have been interfered with. Adolescents, they have freedoms. Oh, they can go up until 10, they can have an allowance. Adults do not have those. Well, they do, but only because they fulfill their duties and responsibilities. You go into court against any peace officer, he is there because he is fulfilling his duty. He's not talking about his right to arrest you. He's talking about his duty. You go in there and you start talking about your rights, who do you think is going to win? You're a child versus a man, essentially. You're like, they're the babysitter, and you're the charge, you're the child, and you're complaining about how the babysitter treats you. And unless you grow up, babysitter will keep nannying you continually. Now this information, a lot of people, when they get to it, I, I've seen how, uh, I've helped a lot of people get to a place where they are far freer than they are now, where they can drive down the highway, or travel down the highway, cop comes up behind them, and they don't get that feeling of fear, they actually look forward to interacting with this cop. There are five steps, five stages that people go through. The first is almost always denial. Absolute denial, rejection of it, I don't believe it, it's not true, you're an anarchist, you hate the government, you hate Canada. Uh, I've had people tell me, Canada is the freest country in the world because you can, you can complain about the government. I said, yeah, I'm happy about that. Well, then don't do it. <laughs> it made no sense to me. So the first one is denial. The second one, of course, is anger. You start realizing you have been badly betrayed. You have been betrayed, and your, uh, your rights have been uh, uh, absconded with. Your rights are gone. You now have a bunch of permission. They give the permission free enough so that you don't see how the, the fence is going up around you. But you will then become angry at this. The third stage, hopefully this is the one that you get through quickest, it's a matter of shame. You will realize this is your country. What the, re the, the reality you enjoy, what's happening, it's up to you. We did that. Robert Sazinki, that guy who died in, the, in uh, the, uh, the airport in Vancouver by being tasered, we're all responsible for that to a certain degree because we allowed this situation to develop. So that third thing you're going to undergo is a bit of shame. The next one is responsibility. If you want power over your future, you must accept fully and completely responsibility for your past. You cannot reject responsibility for your past and claim that you're going to have power in any way over your future. You simply won't. So you have to accept responsibility as your reality, as your life. The final stage is you will start seeing an unfolding of unlimited potential. Once you start realizing how amazing we all are, how we are in fact, the way I looked at it, the big realization I had, I was in a park, and I'm digging my toes into the sand, and I'm laying in the sun, and I'm enjoying it. And these guys came up, and they're talking, and they're blocking my son. I said, hey, guys, move, would you? You're in my son. So they moved. And I thought to myself, what if they had said, I'll move, but you have to pay me? Or what if they had come up and said, no, you take your toes out of the earth, move? The way I felt, I was linked between the sun and the earth. And I felt really, really cool about it. I figure no one's got a right to block my son. No one's got a right to tell me to take my toes out of the dirt. This is my, my space here. And then I realized I had this image of how incredibly big the universe is, eh? Huge! And then I compared it to me. Then I looked at how, how old the universe is, how long it's going to be around. Then I compared it to me. And I realized I just had no time whatsoever for anyone helping me. This is my life. <laughs> You tax someone else, shear someone else, milk someone else. This is my life. I'm here for a very 